The following chapter is included in a book called God Speaking by Facts, which is published in the year 1850. This book was actually the first book I ever gave to my wife in the year 1996, but the chapter is from another book that I own called Persuasives to Early Piety by John Gregory Pike. The Terrors and Fearful Consequences of Death and Judgment to the Unconverted, A Reason for Early Piety. Should you love the world ever so well? Should you enjoy it ever so much and even live in it through the longest term allowed to man? Yet short as the longest and when past, nothing. You must die. How thoughtless soever you may be of death and eternity, they are near to you every hour. And you, even you must die. If you continue to live without God, you must die without him. Imagine yourself leaving the world in that awful state. You must leave it thus unless you repent and remember your Creator. Imagine your last day has arrived. The scene of vanity is ended. The world you love is leaving you forever. Behind you is a wasted and sin-spent life. Before you is the grave, judgment, and eternity. Your day of grace is finished. Your soul is loaded with innumerable sins. It's going to meet that God to whom all your secret guilt has been revealed. Where can you look for refuge? Man cannot help you. And you have every reason to believe God will not. Now sins forgotten come to your mind again. Now guilty pleasures stare you in the face, but all their charms are gone. Now fears and terrors crowd upon your soul and devils seem to beckon you away. All is darkness and misery before. All guilt and folly is behind you. Oh, fearful state. Oh, fearful end of an ungodly life. You must plunge into eternity and justly dread the awful change. No friend can go with you. You must die alone and go alone to meet your God. The hour. The dreadful hour arrives. Your last moment comes. You die. And all the agonies of death are succeeded by the fiercer torments of damnation and despair. No kind angels to welcome your departed spirit. No gentle messengers appear to convey it to eternal rest. Oh, doleful state, if this were the worst, but far worse than this remains untold. Your sweet season of mercy is gone, and in vain you wish for mercy and for time again. Oh, how dreadful a change is this! Oh, when they who trifle with salvation have breathed their last, how may they shrink back from the scene which opens before them? How may their terrified souls wish to creep into their bodies again? But they wish for it in vain. Oh, what a terrible dismay must seize upon them when that eternal world which they neglected all at once appears before them. Oh, could they shrink back for one more year to life? What worlds, if they had them, would they give to obtain this boon? Oh, dreadful hour, when they enter into the world of woe, there to await eternal judgment. Ah, oh, my young friend, remember that day, the now forgotten, But if you live in your sins, a terrible day of judgment will arrive. You may forget it now. You probably laugh at the expectation of it. But will then find it dreadfully serious to see and to feel its terrors. You, even you, must hear the archangel's trumpet. You must behold the descending judge in the burning world. Willing or unwilling, ready or unready, there you must appear. There will be no shrinking from trial, no escape in the notice of the judge, no lingering longer in the grave. Appear you must, for the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There you must give an account for the deeds you have done in the body. Then your actions must be tried, your words examined. Then the black aggravations of your crimes will fully appear. Oh, sinner, 
Then it will be known how you broke through the checks of conscience and the restraints of religion, how you were warned of your danger and exhorted to repent, but still obstinately impenitent, went forward to destruction. The sermons of pastors, the admonitions of friends, and the warnings of the Bible will all be remembered in judgment and produced to show how much greater is your guilt than theirs who lived in heathen lands and had no tidings of salvation. Then, too, it will be known what poor trifles, what base delights you preferred to the love of God and the joys of heaven. O oh, think not to escape. God will bring you into judgment. Your slights of religion, your neglect of God's service, your broken Sabbath, your wasted days, your pride, your vanity must all be answered for on that tremendous day. No, O oh young man, if you are a follower of the world, you must then receive the reward of all your sinful actions, your riotings and revelings, your drunkenness and debaucheries, your hardening others in sin, your wanton songs, your profane words shall all come to light and ensure your damnation. Though you may be a profligate or a scoffing infidel, yet God will bring you into judgment. An infidel as you may be will make you tremble before that bar which is the object of your contempt and ridicule now. Or if you are all that is moral and amiable in the sight of men, Yet if destitute of saving grace, God will see in you ten thousand unforgiven sins, for which he will condemn you then. Know, O oh young woman, that God will then bring you also into judgment. Your Sabbaths wasted in indolence or trifling merriment, your time squandered on poisonous novels, your heart wrapped up in dress and gaiety, while God and religion are shut out of it your mirror consulted while the Redeemer is neglected, your fondness for worldly delights, your forgetfulness of your poor immortal soul. All these sins and many more are crying to heaven against you, and not one in that awful day will be forgotten. At that last day you may call for mercy and God refuse to listen, as he now calls on you to turn to Christ and you refuse to hearken. His word says, because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out mine hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Then, when all his tears are set in array against you, how will you answer him? You cannot say you were not called to serve him, for the lines you are reading would witness against you. You cannot say you were too young and expected a longer time, for he has taught you that the youngest are not too young to die and that those who seek him early shall find him. Alas, what will you then think of this warning? How tremble before your Maker for the sins of your youth. The Lord Jesus Christ will remember your ingratitude and wickedness, and when they who sought and found him betimes have entered his eternal rest, while he crowns him with everlasting love, you, a poor, trembling, unfortunate creature, may knock at the door of mercy, then forever shut. O oh, be wise and guard by early piety against the terrors of that day. The eternal judge will not be thus inexorable unless by your choice of sin you make him so. Give him now your heart, and he will then give you a crown of life which fades not away. But if he will not regard this advice, you will then know your cruelty to your own soul. Then you shall sadly exclaim, God was kind to me. He sought my happiness, and had I listened to his voice, I should have been forever happy. The Son of God was gracious to me. Oh, how numberless were his compassions, had I regarded them. How blessed should I now have been. 
The Spirit of God was kind to me, though grieved and resisted. How long he strove with me! Oh, had I yielded to his gentle influences, no creature surely had been more blessed than I. The servants of God were kind to me. Pious friends warned me and prayed for me and labored for my good and wished for no reward but my salvation. But I, alas, was unkind to all these and cruel to myself. I denied them all. They sought my happiness. All they prayed for was to see me snatched from hell. Oh, had I had but half that compassion for myself, which others had for me, how blessed had I been now. Oh, had I let my God, my Redeemer, my Christian friends or ministers have their desire. I should now have been rising to glory, but ungrateful to God and cruel to myself. I have undone my own soul with an everlasting destruction. Wretch that I was to have no pity on myself, while so many pitied me. Wretch that I was to rush so madly to eternal flames, while so many strove to keep me out, and alas, so obstinately to refuse such blessings, while so many sought to make me a partaker of them. The following chapter is called Dying Regrets. A gay and thoughtless young man says Mr. Innes and his domestic religion who had often opposed a pious father's wishes by spending the Sabbath in idleness and folly, instead of accompanying his parents to the house of God, was taking a ride on a Sabbath morning. After riding some time at a great speed, he hastily pulled his horse when the animal, by stopping more suddenly than he expected, gave him such a sudden jerk that it injured the spinal marrow. And when he came to his father's door, he had totally lost the use of the lower extremities of his body. He was lifted from the saddle and laid on that bed which was destined to prove to him the bed of death. And there he had leisure to reflect on his ways. It was when in the situation I was asked to visit him. He then discovered a deepest solicitude about the things that belonged to his everlasting peace. He eagerly listened to the representation that was given him of the evil of sin, its dreadful consequences, and the ground of hope to the guilty. He seemed much impressed with the sense of his need of pardoning mercy, and thankfully to receive it in the way that God had revealed. Many parts of the conversations I had with him have now escaped my recollection, but some of his expressions I shall not easily forget. On one occasion... When referring to his past life and finding himself at the time I visited him unable to attend public worship, he exclaimed, Oh, what would I give now for some of those Sabbaths which I formerly treated with contempt? He seemed deeply to feel and to deplore his guilt in having so heinously misimproved the precious opportunities of waiting on God and the precious ordinances of religion which he had in a day of health. While on another occasion he expressed his sense of the infinite importance of the gospel, I suggested to him the propriety of mentioning to his dissipated companions, when they called upon him, the light in which his former life now appeared to him. He told me in reply that though he would be most happy to do so, he had no opportunity, that his former companions had now quite deserted him, and that if they called at all it was merely to inquire about his health, but that they seemed quite uneasy while they remained, and would not spend even a few minutes in his company. Ah, oh, what a picture of the friendship of the world! It possesses no ingredients which can furnish a topic of consolation in a day of adversity. It was in reference, however, to the subject, and to the hope that though he had no access to his former associates, his history might prove useful to them, that he uttered the last expression I shall quote. With an ardor and emphasis which I cannot describe, he said to me at one of the last interviews I had with him, I earnestly pray that I may be a warning to them that forget God. He made the solemn and affecting exclamation of a young man on a bed of sickness and death, be fastened on the recollection, especially of every young reader, that instead of forgetting God, he may remember his Creator in the days of his youth, and be found in the season of youth and health, 
supremely valuing that gospel which alone can give solid happiness and life, comfort in affliction, and peace in death. End quote. The following story is called The Aged Procrastinator. In January 1825, Mr. H. of S. New York, says a clergyman, called upon me and taken me by the hand, said, Sir, do you think there is any mercy in heaven for a man who has sinned more than eighty years? There is mercy, I replied, for those who repent of sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Still pressing my hand, while tears were flowing over his wrinkled cheeks and his frame trembling, he more earnestly renewed his inquiry. My dear sir, do you believe that God will forgive a man who has rebelled against him eighty-one years in the world? Before a word was uttered in reply, he cried out in agony, I know I shall not be forgiven. I shall die in my sins. This caused me to ask how he knew, or what induced him to believe that God would never have mercy upon him. He replied, I will tell you, and disclose what I never uttered to any human being. When I was twenty-one, I was awakened to feel that I was a sinner. I was then intimate with a number of young men and ashamed to have them know that I was anxious for my soul. For five or six weeks, I read my Bible and prayed every day in secret. Then I said in my heart one day, I will put the subject off until I am married and settled in life, and then I will attend to my soul salvation. But I knew that I was doing wrong. After I was settled in the world, I thought of the resolution I had made and of my solemn promise to God then to make my peace with Him. But as I had no disposition to do so, I again said to my heart, I will put off this subject ten years and then prepare to die. The time came and I remembered my promise, but I had no special anxiety about my salvation. Then did I again postpone and resolve that if God would spare me through another term of years, I would certainly attend to the concerns of my soul. God spared me, but I lived on in my sins, and now I see my awful situation. I am lost. Now I believe that I sinned against the Holy Ghost when I was twenty-one, and that I have lived sixty years since my day of grace was past. I know that I shall not be forgiven. When asked if I should pray for him, he replied, Yes, but it will do me no good. So fearfully certain was he of his destruction. He continued in the state for weeks and months. All attempts to urge him to accept of salvation were in vain. This blighting sentiment was ever first in his thoughts. It will do no good. His feelings were not contrition or repentance for sin, but the anticipations of wrath to come. And in this state he died. From the magazine the New York Observer. The following story is called The Praying Mother. In early life, I was well acquainted with a pious woman who was left a widow with five children, four sons and a daughter. Though I was very young at the time, and though many years have since passed, I can never forget the afflicting scene I witnessed at the death of her husband. I saw the family kneeling round the sick bed, while the mother commended the dying father to God in prayer. And when the moment of separation came, and it was whispered that he was gone, the daughter wept aloud in her grief, and the mother gave vent to her sorrow in the language of one of Charles Wesley's fine hymns, My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. The heart knows its own bitterness. But what can equal the anguish of that emotion which first tells a mother that she is a widow and that the children are fatherless? They feel its pangs once to forget it no more forever. This pious mother endeavored to train up her children in the fear of God. But notwithstanding her prayers and instructions, she saw with deep regret her sons leaving home, one after another, and eagerly engaging in the pursuits of the world without religion. As her years increased and her health declined, she felt that what more she could do to promote the salvation of her children must be done quickly. 
she resolved to try the efficacy of prayer and began to spend whole nights in pleading with God to work by His Spirit on the minds of her children. Her faith increased with the fervor and frequency of her prayers. One night, especially, her soul was visited with such a manifestation of the Divine Presence that she felt confident the Lord was about to answer her prayers, and she was not mistaken. For the same night her youngest son, then about thirteen or fourteen years of age, was brought under conviction by hearing his mother praying for him at midnight. He sought the Lord in his youth, and has for many years been employed in preaching the gospel. Her eldest son, then living at a distance, wrote home to inform his mother that the Spirit of God had been striving with him so powerfully that he could find no rest night or day till he began to seek the Lord. He afterward became a useful preacher and in early life went triumphantly to heaven. About the same time, her second son walked 26 miles one day to tell his mother what the Lord had done for his soul. The daughter also embraced religion and has seen her own children walking in the fear of God. This praying mother felt her joy to be full and was ready to say, Let me depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. But it is the affecting story of her third son which has called forth this narrative, hoping it may afford encouragement to some praying mother who may chance to read your assistant. This son, the mother thought to be the most kind and amiable of all her children, who was placed under the care of a distinguished lawyer, but unhappily fell a prey to temptation. Being possessed of those qualities of mind which made him an agreeable companion, he was induced to join parties of pleasure, and by the most imperceptible degrees fell a victim to occasional intemperance, and was led from one degree of folly to another till at length he and a number of his young companions enlisted as soldiers in the 48th Regiment of the British Light Infantry, and soon after joined Lord Wellington's army in Spain, then engaged in a sanguinary warfare with the French, where he and many of his young companions fell at the Battle of Salmanca. When the sad tidings of his untimely death reached home, and nearly broke his mother's heart, she hastily concluded she had been in vain praying for her son upwards of twenty years, and that he had been suddenly cut off in his sin, and inevitably placed beyond the reach of mercy and the possibility of hope. She refused to be comforted, and said with Jacob, I will go down into the grave unto my son, mourning. She often exclaimed, O oh, my son, hast thou but known in thy day the things that belong unto thy peace, but now I fear they are hidden from thine eyes. This may well be called the bitterness of sorrow, the very gall of bitterness. It pleased the Almighty, however, to condescend in rather a remarkable way to comfort this disconsolate mother. During one of her sleepless nights, for she literally watered her couch with her tears, she saw or thought she saw her unfortunate son enter her room and effectually entreat her to sorrow no more on his account. For the Lord had given him a space to repent, that he had found mercy and was saved. However, the unbeliever may be disposed to smile that this is a mere phantom of imagination. It had the happiest effect on her mind. Her sorrow was turned into joy, and she never afterward doubted his salvation. But what makes the incident still more remarkable is that when the regiment returned from Spain, and all the circumstances were made known to the family, the youngest son, now a minister in this country, anxious to learn all he could respect in the last hours of his unfortunate brother, hastened to the headquarters of the regiment to make inquiries respecting him. He found but one of the number alive who went with him, and was happy to learn from him and others what so exactly agreed with his mother's impressions. For while many of his young companions were killed on the spot, he was spared seven weeks after he was wounded. And while lying in the hospital among the dying... His mother's prayers and instructions were brought to his remembrance, and that spirit he had so often grieved in answer to his mother's prayers once more returned to produce conviction on his mind. Thus truly had he space for repentance, 
and we know that God will appear in mercy to a contrite spirit. When this youth left a companion of his brother, of whom he had obtained the above information, and found himself alone, he sat upon a stone by the roadside to weep in astonishment, to see how much the effectual fervent prayers of his pious mother had availed in the behalf of her ungodly son. I esteem it an honor, said one, that I am descended from ancestors more eminent for their piety than their rank, and more illustrious for their virtues than their wealth. Such children are distinguished as a seed which the Lord has blessed, and their love for the Father's sake. They are early brought into the bond of the covenant, and are favored with pious instruction, enforced by a holy example, watered with many affectionate tears and prayers. In all cases, a religious education is a powerful restraint upon the commission of sin, and in many instances it is blessed to the conversion of the youthful heart to God. Timothy, by reading in the Holy Scriptures, which probably he was early taught to do by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice, was made wise unto salvation, and many of the brightest ornaments of the Christian church have received from godly parents their first serious impressions. A mother in writing to a son, on the birth of his eldest child says, Give him an education that his life may be useful. Teach him religion that his death may be happy. End quote. From the article called The Mother's Assistant. The following article is called The Danger of a Deathbed Repentance. Never can it be too deeply impressed on the minds of all who are anxious to bring sinners to Christ that health is a season of benefit as well as of usefulness. Of the man who, amid the excitements of life, becomes awakened to an apprehension of his guilt and danger, we may entertain some reasonable hope. But when cares for eternity come across the mind only when it has nothing else to engage it, the result is at best doubtful. The sick demand our kindness, our sympathy, and our prayers. But if we wish to save men's souls, our chief attention must be directed to those who need no other physician. Through inattention to this point, some of the best energies of the church are thrown away. Persons in all diseases and in all stages of disease have been eagerly sought out with the benevolent intention of showing them the way to heaven, while the healthful inmates of the same dwelling have been left to pursue their own path to hell without one word of entreaty or warning. In many instances, the visitation of the sick is perfectly useless. It is almost always so in fevers and diseases connected with delirium and in cases where delirium is not apparent, there is often imbecility. I have attended persons in malignant fevers who seemed perfectly conscious at the time and exceedingly thankful for my visit, but who on recovery had not the slightest recollection of anything that had taken place. Conversion in the last extremity of life is the only hope of the multitude. It is the last resort of the impenitent, and Christians have sanctioned the delusion. Even their anxiety to visit the sick has been wrongly interpreted by the world and taken to indicate views of religion from which an enlightened mind would shrink with horror. Thousands are of opinion that all that needs to be done to set them right for heaven is to have some spiritual advisor to attend their last hours. This, their way, is their folly yet their posterity approve their sayings. Warm-hearted but injudicious Christians have given it their sanction by laying great stress on circumstances which at best would warrant a trembling hope. Sorrow for sin and alarm of conscience prompted only by the near approach of eternity have been mistaken for conviction and repentance of a godly sort, and the promises of the gospel and the consolations of Christ have been addressed to persons to whom the extent and spirituality of the claims of God and the terrors of his righteous law would have been subjects far more seasonable. The result of such common treatment is that all anxiety is hushed, and a calm ensues which not a breath disturbs. The man is mistaken remorse 
for repentance and vows a new life for evidence that he is a new creature. All misgivings, doubts, and fears are henceforth regarded as intrusive and are instantly put away. A deceived heart has turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? And thus he leaves the world. His supposed conversion and happy death supply the subject of a funeral sermon. Large numbers attend for the occasion as an attractive one. They wish to learn how men neglect the claims of God in health and strength and yet find peace and joy on the arrival of sickness and death. It is the very thing which they most of all desire. If they may but neglect religion all their lives, they have no objection whatever to pay it their dying regards. They listen with approving attention and take courage to trifle a little longer. Oh, what a sermon would they have if the lost soul could occupy that pulpit and tell them that the peace which comes not by the blood of the cross is a delusion and that the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. I am aware that such statements as these are thought very uncharitable, be it so. Charity to the dead is often destructive to the living, and it is with the latter exclusively that we have to do. The departed cannot be injured or even annoyed by any judgment of ours, however uncharitable, whereas our favorable opinion concerning them may induce others to go and do likewise. To trifle with Christ in eternity till life is almost gone, and then when the world can charm no longer to compromise manners with their Creator, as best they may. Thus, while on one hand the indulgence of groundless hope can render no service to the objects of our compassion, now, alas, too late their state being fixed forever. On the other, survivors may be strengthened in their impiety and the threatenings of God made of none effect. But an objection may be started. What right have we to entertain an unfavorable opinion or to pronounce judgment when all the evidence we have is to the contrary? The answer to this question turns upon another. Is that evidence satisfactory? A pastorate of nearly 20 years has made me familiar with scenes of affliction. I can hardly remember a case in which sickness did not dispose the mind to think seriously of religion, especially when early associations had led that way. But how has it been with those who have returned to health again? They have left religion in the chamber of affliction, and not a vestige of piety has remained to attest the genuineness of their conversion. I have seen sinners brought to God amid all the varieties of Christian experience, some by a long and almost imperceptible process, others comparatively in a moment. But scarcely in a single instance have I found conversion or even real awakening dated from affliction. If ten were cleansed, where are the nine? It has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Would that piety, which could not stand the test of a return to health, have availed a soul in death? I shall never forget an example of disappointed hope which occurred in the early part of my ministry. A young man who had been instructed in a Sabbath school as to the elements of religion, but had never made any pretensions to piety, was stricken with an alarming disease. His concern about his soul was immediate and overwhelming. What must I do to be saved? seemed the one question which absorbed all his thoughts. Those around him did not fail to expound the reply of Paul and Silas. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He listened most intently. Hope sprang up in his soul in passages of scripture which he had learned at school, but which had till then escaped his memory, came pouring into his mind with a richness, propriety, and consecutiveness truly wonderful. Disease now gained upon him, and all hope of recovery fled. The surgeon plainly told him that nothing more could be done, and that a few hours more would terminate his life. He received the announcement with perfect composure and said that he had no wish to live. His only desire was to depart and to be with Christ. In experience as I then was, had he died, I should have not entertained a doubt of his safety. But the surgeon was mistaken. To the surprise of everyone, his recovery was soon completed. 
He went to the house of God the first Sabbath he was able to walk and return thanks to God for his restoration. For the next few Sabbaths following, he was there. Afterward, I missed him. For some time, I was unable to learn what had become of him. At last, I ascertained that an act of gross immorality had rendered it expedient for him to leave the neighborhood. After the lapse of about twenty years, I very unexpectedly met him once again. During the interval, he had become a hardened sot. At the time of this interview, however, he was perfectly sober, but appeared to have forgotten me. I reminded him of his vows and affliction. He then mentioned my name. I endeavored to recall his former impressions, but the attempt was hopeless. His conscience was seared as with a hot iron. All I could get him to say of the affliction that once seemed so hopeful was, I have no wish to remember it. End quote. From the book Decapolis by the Reverend D. E. Ford. The infallible certainty of God threatened judgments. All who are familiar with the words of eternal life often turn to the pathetic expostulation which closes the 23rd chapter of Matthew's Gospel. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as furnishing one of the most beautiful and affecting specimens of the infinite tenderness of the divine nature to be found even in the sacred volume. Jesus weeping at the grave of Lazarus lets in upon the night of human sorrow and depression a cheering ray of divine sympathy. Jesus weeping over guilty and perishing Jerusalem makes us acquainted in some small degree with the riches of the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God and affords another proof, if proof were requisite, of the apostles' cheering assertion that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But to view this passage as an isolated text would be to lose much of its pathos and amiss altogether a most important moral principle which it conveys. If we consider the context in which this passage is set, like some diamond gem of light, some brilliant solitary star in a lowering sky, the holy indignation which immediately precedes it, the common fixed determination of purpose which immediately follows it, not only will this burst of love beam with intenser brightness from between these gloomy and portentous clouds, but also a most important and most necessary lesson will be conveyed to impenitence and unbelief as to the awful and infallible certainty of God's threatened judgments. There is perhaps no more serious obstacle in the human mind to repentance and reformation than the vague idea entertained of the divine mercy as if mercy were the same weak passion in God as it is in man, and that the cry of suffering, however merited, should swallow up all the other attributes, the truth, the justice, the holiness of God. But the passage before us strikes at the very root of this dangerous delusion. It exhibits to us Christ, the image of the invisible God, our judge at the final day of judgment not only denouncing, but actually commencing to execute his judgments upon the impenitent. And this, not in wrath, but in sorrow, with eyes suffused with tears, with a heart beating in sympathy, and with the tenderest feelings of commiseration for those very sufferings which he was himself about to inflict. Thus, while it magnifies the divine compassion to the utmost, it but establishes more strongly the awful fact that if it were impossible even for the omnipotent God to exercise mercy towards man unless in full harmony with his other attributes and in full accordance with those holy laws which he has graciously revealed to us as being the essential principles, the fixed and unalterable rules of his moral government. In short, it convinces us that even though the passing of that sentence depart you cursed into everlasting fire, or to melt the divine bosom with still deeper sorrow than did that mysterious sacrifice in which the Father spared not his well-beloved Son. Yet that God will not, because he cannot consistently, with his unchangeable attributes at the bar of final judgment, pardon the impenitent and unbelieving and the unsanctified. But let us consider the context. 
addressing the scribes and Pharisees, he says, Feel ye up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell when they're ruined with us, proclaimed by the lips of infallible truth? And they were given over to a reprobate mind instead of removing as we should have expected. He proceeds to declare on this very account. He would accumulate upon them means of grace which he well knew and declares they would regret and abuse to their destruction. That thus the disease might be brought to its crisis and the harvest might ripen for the sickle of destruction. That thus God might be justified in his saying, and cleared when he entered into judgment, and that his final sentence of final reprobation might be vindicated to assembled men and angels. Wherefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, to the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation, the view of the tremendous judgments which were coming upon them, and which these words suggested, opened the floodgates of tenderness and compassion in his divine mind. And he who, a moment before, had denounced them as hypocrites, as serpents, and is a generation of vipers, now bursts into that pathetic and affecting expostulation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, pleads with them his own patience and long suffering, looks back through every vista of unforgetting memory upon the illuminated scenes of past endearment, of proffered mercy and love, complains tenderly and mournfully complains of their infatuated blindness their obstinate impenitence and hardness of heart, and describes by one of the most touching images of parental tenderness, a hen gathering her chickens under her wings and shielding them by her own life from every assault of the enemy, describes this constancy. How often the willingness would I, the tenderness of his paternal care and anxiety, have gathered your children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings. And the cause of the failure of all these efforts and of their impending ruin and you would not. But do we not detect here the symptoms of vacillation and relenting of what in man would be called amiable weakness? Has not mercy so rejoiced against judgment as that God's truth and justice and holiness have failed? Is then this church of hypocrites, of murderers of the prophets, of haters of God to be continued in the possession of its prostituted privileges, and when its iniquity is full, still to stand forth before the world as the church of Christ? By no means. Our Lord proceeds to confirm the sentence and to announce those miseries over which he mourned. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He not only announces, but proceeds to execute thus. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. This, observe, was our Lord's last visit to the temple, and thus formally quitting it forever. He abandoned this infatuated and devoted people to final impenitence and hopeless ruin. When Christ has departed from the temple, no means of grace can be efficacious. Its rites and ceremonies can be but weak and beggarly elements. Its oblations vain, and all its sacrifices and prayers but an abomination to the Lord. When our Lord uttered those awfully portentous words which sealed the fiat of Jerusalem's doom, and which struck, as it were, the keynote of the tenderest mood in the divine mind, all these things shall come upon this generation. His omniscient mind cast a prophetic glance into futurity and saw the tremendous judgments that within the short space of forty years were to be transacted on that very spot on which he then for the last time stood. He saw literally and accurately fulfilled all those tremendous judgments which Moses fifteen hundred years before 
predicted as the inevitable consequence of an apostasy from God and recorded in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy in language which, though written more than 3,000 years ago, might be adopted as a faithful history of the fate of this unhappy people from the destruction of Jerusalem to the present day. Such was the sight of misery and horror which met the omniscient eye as it looked into the future and there read the destiny of this devoted people and which observed for this is the principle which I desire to inculcate could not stay the righteous arm of divine vengeance though it swept every cord of tenderness and compassion in the divine bosom, end quote. From the magazine, the London Christian Observer, 